Great, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar today on drone insurance and risk management. And as Dan said, we're trying to make this as collaborative as possible. So throughout the webinar, if you have questions, you can type them in the bottom of the chat box. It says type message here, or you could relay them to Dan and uh, we can discuss throughout the, ent the entire presentation, or we can pass along later to uh, another section where we'll, we'll address the question. So we'll, we'll begin. First, uh, introductions, you know, who is Global Aerospace? Global Aerospace is the leading provider of aviation insurance and risk management solutions. We have over 95 years of aviation insurance experience, and that enables us to develop customized insurance programs structured around the needs of our clients. The product lines range from light aircraft to business jets and general aviation, as well as major manufacturers, aviation service providers, commercial airlines like United, satellites, and, and of course drones, which we'll be discussing today. We were the first aviation insurance company to create unmanned an, an unmanned aircraft policy in 2013, and today we insure well over 10,000 drones. We have clients ranging from Fortune 100 companies pushing the boundaries of drone capabilities, as well as some of the biggest drone manufacturers in the world, down to the an individual operator flying for real estate photography. So clients ranging from, from top to bottom, we handle and service uh, thousands of, of drone policies throughout the year. And now we'll play a quick, quick corporate video of our CEO, Nick Brown. Just to let you know, Patrick, I don't believe the sound is coming through. All right, well, we'll go ahead and skip the video for now and hopefully I'll be able to figure out in the later videos. What he was saying is we are an aviation specialist and, and really that is what we do. We are owned by uh, Berkshire in Munich Re. We have offices all over the world. We're based in London and have five branch offices uh, around the United States. All of our, or the majority of our claims are ha handled in-house. Uh, the about 90% of our ad claims adjusters are licensed attorneys. So if we were to take our licensed attorneys and create a law firm, some people have said that it would be the largest aviation law firm out there in the world. So we have several several attorneys but also underwriters across the world handling uh, different policies and uh, a little bit about myself or, or my background uh, hello again everybody my name is patrick quinn i'm going to be your speaker today i joined global uh, back in october 2015 as an underwriting associate in dallas texas i was promoted senior underwriter in december 2019 and recently relocated to the northeast office in parsippany New Jersey, just outside Manhattan. I'm a general aviation underwriter, so I craft insurance policy solutions for business jets, airports, manufacturers, fixed based operators, service providers, and I've been working on the drone team for almost four years now. So uh, lots of change in the drone space in the past four years, going back to old regulations and establishing the first regulations in the drone industry up to what it's now, uh, actually a, a, a ton of progress, which, it, which is interesting to be a part of. I graduated University of South Carolina with an insurance management degree, and I currently hold my remote pilot airman certificate, which I'll get into a little bit later. I have a DJI Mavic Pro that I fly on the side as a hobby. I grew up in an aviation family and studied insurance, so kind of marrying the two is uh, a, a good landing spot uh, at Global Air Aerospace. Moving on. Here's today's agenda. 
Uh, first, we'll uh, go over an overview of the drone market uh, before we get into drone claims, drone UAS policy coverage, uh, claims, risk management, best practices, and hopefully at the end of the webinar today, we'll equip you with enough knowledge of the drone market and insurance to be able to speak to your clients confidently. Before we dive in, I wanted to address some of the commercial drones on the market that I'm sure you guys have are familiar with or may have may have seen. Your average system costs anywhere from five hundred to twenty five thousand dollars, depending on the use and uh, whoever is operating the aircraft. It, it really depends, but I would say your your average would run about fifteen hundred dollars. So they come in two different fashions. Rotor wing and fixed wing drones on the right uh, on the right side. You'll see a DJ Inspire that's a rotor wing, and most rotor wings are quadcopters. There are hexacopters or even octocopters in the market, such as a DJI Matrice. The Inspire 2, for example, has a max speed of about 58 miles per hour, can fly for about 23 minutes, it has sense and avoid technology, meaning if you tried to ram it into the wall, it would stop and or avoid it. There's sophisticated camera options uh, that can detect infrared or uh, a very nice camera for a movie movie shot. So lots of flexibility with your camera and gimbal options on the Inspire. It's really what the probably the workhorse of the drone marketplace today. On the bottom, you'll find a SenseFly EB that can run you a bit more and for that reason you're really going to see more agriculture or longer surveys such as pipeline patrol. This one weighs only about three pounds and can fly up to six to eight miles per hour and it can stay in the air for for almost an hour so you're going to see that again on an agriculture field that will uh, consist of dozens of acres so it can scan and research and collect the data from there most are most drones are under five pounds, they can typically fit in the size of a backpack or some of the bigger ones would be a checked luggage. The pieces to a commercial drone uh, are the aircraft itself and the gimbal would be the arm that connects, connects the unit or the aircraft to the actual payload. The payload would be the camera and then in most cases or all cases, Drones have, have rotors, which are detachable units. Now setting the stage for the commercial drone market in, in the uses and the way it's split, the majority of operators out there are using it for real estate and aerial photography. That's where you're gonna have the lowest cost of entry, meaning they could buy, buy a $700 drone off amazon.com and and then fly it the next day and post it to YouTube to, to try to sell a house. So that is where you're gonna see the bulk of operators, but it, in this case, there is significant growth in state and local governments, whether it's firefighters, uh, police operators, or parks and recreations, or any, any use in municipalities, there's plenty of opportunities there. Now, going back to some of the uses here, most people think of the drone as a sophisticated military technology or a hobbyist tool for capturing a sunset or sporting events and cityscapes. But businesses across industries realize that drones have multiple commercial applications, some of which go beyond basic surveillance, photography, or videos, and they're already using them to transform daily work in some industries. Insurance companies are using drones to inspect damaged assets, for instance, and farmers are sending them to monitor crops and collect soil data. Even more dramatic changes could be in store as innovators explore new uses, including drone delivery services for retail stores 
in air taxis and commuters, which I'll touch on later today. The leading segment for drones is really industrial inspection in real estate, uh, particularly for industrial inspection, which includes industries such as construction, energy, mining. Uh, they, they use drones to survey sites and transmission lines, among other things. Use in agriculture for spraying crops and analyzing fields uh, rank, ranks a, a close second or third, depending on which source, source you're getting your information from. Like the internet and GPS before them, drones are evolving beyond their military origin to become powerful business tools. They've already made a leap into the consumer market, and now they're be, be put, being put to work in the commercial and civil government applications from firefighting to farming. That's creating a marketing opportunity that's too large to ignore. Elaborating a little bit more on the commercial market today, it's estimated to be $4.9 billion. Public acceptance is increasing, uh, whereas normally or in the past, the, the humming of a drone would be an odd sound that you're not familiar with. If you have heard a drone, you would uh, certainly be familiar with the sound, but it, it is becoming more and more common, whether you're at a sporting event or or at a construction site or, or, or driving by the, the beach and seeing a drone fly up in there next to a kite. People are becoming familiar with drones. However, there's a, a ton of change in, in the market right now. And that primarily, uh, the primary driver behind that is congested airspace and in future claims, which is why, we, why we're all here for risk management to get a better understanding. DJI, is the Chinese manufacturer. They are the dominant carrier in excess of 90% um, of the commercial market is DJI drones, meaning the Inspire, the Mavic, the Phantom 4 Pro, or some of the others like a DJI Matrice. DJI is actually, when I reference an industry shakeout, they have priced out or forced competitors to to pivot to other areas such as 3dr that used to be a drone that was sold in in best buy and they they recently pivoted away from manufacturing to providing software solutions and same with the parrot company that you'd see at a brookstone uh, store or parrot parrot drones they're smaller more toys but they're pivoting away from manufacturing drones because DJI has captured so much of the market. Accidents are certainly becoming a common occurrence, uh, whether that is a, a drone flyway where you press return to home and it may have been the last place you, you were flying and not the most current return to home, or it could be as simple as a software update between the controller in the drone and, in, and not connecting well, but accidents are certainly occurring on, on an everyday basis at this point. The commercial market today, this gives you a, a picture of really how many drones we have out there versus manned aircraft. In just a few weeks, in five weeks in 2016, when the FAA opened up the drone registry, the number of unmanned aircraft exceeded manned aircraft growth. So that just shows you how congested the skies will be and the way the industry will be forced to change on a regulatory monitoring and communication uh, standpoint. So now that you know about the commercial drone market, we can get, I can highlight some of the parts of the future of the drone market. That's certainly where some of the exciting parts are. You can see where I'm sure you'll see in the news where Uber is planning to launch in Dubai or LA or in Dallas for vertical takeoff and manned flight or unmanned flight or pilotless vehicles, but 
the FAA predicts the number of commercial drones to rise to 400, 450,000 by 2020. There's significant growth and the industry is shifting to, to change how these drones are identified, but also located so we can share the airspace and it's not separate from manned airspace. Urban air mobility, I'll categorize the three Three, I'll categorize urban mobility under three different uh, under three different titles. Probably first is the most common that you guys will hear of or, or, or want immediately is delivering your packages on Amazon within a matter of minutes rather than next day or day of. Uh, the last minute delivery is really rapid delivery of packages that are less than five pounds from local distribution hubs to a dedicated receiving vessel. The deliveries are unscheduled and routed as online orders are placed. Small drones are uh, typically only flying about uh, no more than 10 miles based on their current battery usage. And there's some testing that's going on in Virginia, but as well as overseas, particularly in Australia and last minute delivery that I'll highlight later. The second category for urban air mobility would really be an, an air metro type solution that resembles the current public transit options, such as a subway and buses with predetermined routes, regular schedules, and set stops in high traffic areas throughout each city. These vehicles would be autonomously operated and can accommodate two to five passengers at a time. And then third would be air taxi. I mentioned Uber Air. This would be the vehicle on the, on the bottom left of your screen, number three. The, the air taxi use case is a door-to-door -door ride sharing operation that allows consumers to call vertical takeoff and landings or VTOLs to their desired pickup locations and specified drop-off destinations at rooftops throughout a given city. Rides are unscheduled and on demand, like ride sharing applications like Uber or Lyft. Like the Air Metro case, these vehicles are autonomously operated and can accommodate around two to five passengers. They're currently being developed right now and still in the testing phases by major manufacturers such as Boeing or Bell, both of which are current global clients. I think I jumped ahead one, one moment. And then lastly, drone delivery. Before we get into drone delivery, I'll, I'll explain FAA Part 135. It's a charter type services that they have to go through the FAA. And there's rigorous safety requirements and evidence of testing, and it could take several years. And there's tons of documentation, safety standards, standard operating procedures, and legal counsel. So this requires tons of upfront investment. Uh, something that you'll see is plenty of drone startups out there in the market tooting that they can pr provide drone delivery. But in this case, obtaining a part 135 charter type service is a long process that will take several years in investment that uh, we don't expect some of these startups out there in the market to last. One that has received their, or the first one that received their part 135 and, and latest is Project Wing, Alphabet, or uh, Alphabet is the parent company of Google. They launched their first public drone service in Canterbury, Australia. They've been in Australia since 2014 and they conducted more than 70,000 flights and delivered thousands of packages. As just a few months ago, they were the first company certified to operate as an airline. Air carrier certification means that we can begin a, means that they can begin a commercial service delivering goods to local businesses, uh, from local businesses to homes in the United States. Right now they're testing in Blacksburg and Christianburg, which is in Southern Virginia, uh, Virginia. Blacksburg is where Virginia Tech 
university's campus is located. It coincides with a lot of their engineering department and they've team, teamed up well over the years to uh, create and allow uh, the testing to take place. But this is mostly in rural Southern Virginia, not above crowds or, or congested areas with little traffic to or air traffic to interfere with. These wing electric drones are powered by 14 propellers, nearly all of which are top mounted to help carry loads up to 3.3 pounds. They're meant to deliver a wide, wide range of everyday items and drinks from medicine to emergency, pli emergency supplies. The Secretary of Transportation, uh, Elaine Chow, said this is an important step forward for the safe testing and integration of drones into our economy. Safety continues to be our number one priority as technology continues to develop and realize its full potential. There are several uh, drone companies that are, are testing overseas, uh, mainly in Australia right now, but Alphabet is one of the, is the only drone delivery company that has received their part 135. There, there are a few companies such as UPS, Matternet, or Flirty that have still been in the testing phases but haven't re officially received their Part 135. In the Wake, Wake Forest medical example in Raleigh, they had a drone deliver blood samples in, from one hospital area to the next hospital area. So in this case, it was a 1.2 mile area where they had to drive in traffic. It could take up to 30 minutes in downtown Raleigh. But in this case, they were able, the FAA approved flights to deliver blood samples to the other campus and eliminated 20, 25 plus minutes out of the equation. It'll end up saving a ton of lives. So next on today's agenda, we'll review the FAA regulations to, for commercial operations. That would be categorized under something called Part 107. And feel free if you guys have any questions, type them in the chat box or, or mention them to Dan. Dan, was there anything that I, that I brought up that you wanted me to elaborate on? No, I think you're good. All right, I'll continue, thanks. So UAS regulations, it's called FAA, FAR Part 107. It was released in August, 29, August 2016 and it replaced the old section triple three under the FAA Moderniz Modernization and Reform Act. It really was the first major move by the FAA to pave the way for commercial drone operators. In the past, they had to hire a lawyer or consultant to officially go through all the paperwork to get a part or triple three. And what this, what this did was allow and pave a, a strict standard way for a business operator who wanted to get involved in, in drones. So there are five main rules under part 107 for the basis of their standard operating procedures. First is the visual line of sight and below 400 feet. Next it requires a, an operator, meaning a pilot to be a qualified remote pilot airman certificate or even the spotter. So if someone was unlicensed as an operator, they could they could fly under, if the spotter had their license, they could fly under their certificate. Again, the certificate is called remote pilot airman certificate. It's also could be swapped out for SUAS rating or small air or small light aircraft rating. Then, then there's no flights over persons not in, directly involved in the operations of the flight. 
There's no flights or flights in controlled airspace. There's a 55 pound weight limit. And additionally, it requires all drones about half a pound to 55 pounds to be registered with the FAA. And that includes not just commercial operators, but hobbyists as well. The next, next topic is the remote pilot knowledge test, the RPAC or SUAS rating, which I mentioned before. The, for non-pilots, like I, like I imagine most people on the call, including myself, I do not have my pilot's license to operate a, an aircraft outside of a drone. So I, what, it, what you'd have to do is study for this remote pilot knowledge test it probably takes one one to three weeks with at least 20 hours of studying and you go in an FAA approved test center and the test includes your drone ops, getting familiar with national airspace, learning the drone loading and performance, including weather, maps, regulations, local, state and national laws. So you can see in that top right, it it does ask that you are able to decipher this standard flight map that all airmen are familiar with, and you'll be able to receive the license of, after passing the test, that bottom right license. If you are a current pilot, whether you have a sport, light aircraft, commercial, or any of the standard pilot's license available on the market, you are able to log in to a website through your your FB, your local FBO and take the test online with an unlimited number of uh, chances. That being, this test is very entry level for understanding mapping and airspace that any current pilot or active pilot will already understand the majority of these rules and regulations, aside from a few of the a few of the feet requirements and outside and distances away from specific airports. So I mentioned things that you can't do under part 107, which brings us to drone waivers through the FAA. This is a paperwork process through the FAA if you want to fly from a moving vehicle, fly above the standard 400 feet, fly beyond visual line of sight, fly over people or night operations. And flights over people is point, 0 0.6. It didn't, and didn't register with this chart when I blew it up to view in this PowerPoint slide. But the night operations is really the majority of the granted waivers for a very simple reason, when it, when it's night, you're able to see the blinking lights or constant lights from the from the drone. It's the least exposure is as far as the FAA cons is concerned with national airspace, and it is the most common, meaning the most people have done it and the most people have published about how to obtain a night waiver. So it's it's really starting to pick up speed and traction. I would say your average average operator who has a part-time part -time job, flies more than 20 or 30, 30 times a year has probably received or requested a night ops waiver. That's after dusk. There currently has been 2,847 uh, 2, FAA waivers issued. There's currently no minimum insurance requirement, which is why the industry is really rapidly changing, specifically with regards to insurance. I'll talk about limits uh, later on. And then there's no aircraft certification process in place. And I, when I say aircraft certification, I don't mean registering your aircraft. I'm, de, I'm talking about reg, building a drone and flying it in the air. There's nothing stopping someone from building a drone in 
their garage and testing out and flying it within part 107 rules and regulations if they're appropriate license there's nothing wrong and that's that's really the a huge driving factor behind it when you consider there's no certification process in place or or standard operating procedures behind these drones they could fly fly away go haywire versus the manned aircraft side which i'm sure all people heard have heard about the Boeing aircraft going through the certification process, which lasts several years. For example, the Honda jet, there, there's a recent, recent jet that is manufactured in the past couple of years, and that took 12 years to obtain a certification. Now it is different because it's carrying passengers, but at the same time, there is no certification process, which is really something I could see changing here in the future. Now back to the waiver process and flights over people. This drone right here uh, is from CNN, this, a snap drone. And the funny, funny part is requiring flights over people also requires the FAA or the, the FAA asks that you show the frangibility. So the frangibility meaning the the way the all of the pieces fall and break when there is a crash so it, it really again sort of shows that a only a company like cnn would be able to pour millions of dollars into a manufacturing a drone with the with the frangibility so they can fly over people to get that media shot and they jumped through several several hoops and had a a fleet of lawyers trying to trying to assist them with that. But there's the that's the CNN snap drone that you'll see flying above people. Next step in actually one of the the waiver processes beyond visual line of sight, which I would expect comes in the near future. And what that does is really exactly what it what it what it sounds like or, or or says. You you're able to fly beyond visual line of sight, outside two miles uh, away from where where you're located, and remotely operate the vehicle. So, so this could be done for this will be done for delivery, pipeline monitoring such as oil and gas, fire detection and suppression. And the the aircraft on the right is the in situ Scan Eagle. Its first flight was in 2002, and in 2013, they obtained the approval to uh, fly beyond visual line of sight in Beaufort Sea, north of Alaska for ConocoPhillips. But really the real main point behind this is that the te technology has been around for a long time and already has tremendous capabilities. The problem is that we're trying to figure out airspace integration and regulatory governing body, governing bodies to support this type of technology as opposed to hinder it. Okay, now on now on to the important part: yeah, UAS coverage overview or, or drone drone insurance. So the the way we see it, there's a few options or three main options to consider when you're looking at purchasing or covering your drone or a client's drone. The first and most common place we've seen it, although it's changing, is an extension of general liability policies. So this is your standard GL policy where you will add the drone exposure at little to, to no additional premium although I will warn that it comes with very key exclusions, such as flying outside rules and regulations or within the local and state uh, it, law enforcement, which can come with several disadvantages, along with a PNC adjuster 
trying to work out a, a claim that happened in national airspace could be a little tricky. Although most liability claims, uh, or there have been very few liability claims, several have been paid out, excess of $1 million that did require an aviation expertise. So that's where global airspace really comes in to play. A specialist aviation insurance policy, that's something that global, global airspace provides. It's a specific unmanned aircraft system drone policy with broad coverage and broad wording. We have dedicated loss adjusters. Our, our loss adjusters out in Kansas City have handled thousands of drone claims. And it also really, on the basis of risk appetite and capacity, Global Airspace is able to offer specific wordings, counseling for certificates of, evidence, uh, certificates of insurance or additional insured wording and capacity we we're able to provide limits excess of 500 million all the way up to a billion if necessary, although very few have purchased that type of coverage. And then on-demand uh, on demand products is something newer, but uh, there's been no short of insure tech startups getting into the space. One of them is Verify. It's a mobile application that you can download on your phone. Similar to Uber, where you pull up a map and request a ride, you would request a an insurance policy for whether it's an hour, two hours, or five hours, and you can pick your limit, your duration, uh, the size or scope of your project, depending on how how far you're flying, and then that provides at no cost an invoice and a certificate. So Verify. Uh, I'll touch on a little bit later, but that's one of the on-demand products out there in the marketplace. So on the coverage overview, for I'll, talk, I'll specifically talk to aviation policies because that's where our expertise is. Liability or casualties. This is your third party bodily injury or property damage. Uh, that you could cause for a drone operator. So uh, the, simply put, it is the damage that you can cause to someone or something with your drone. And then second would be your, your physical damage. Your physical damage of your drone, your first party property, property meaning your, the actual, we, we call it the hull of your aircraft the body of your aircraft, including the camera, the ground equipment, and these, and these can get very expensive. Uh, going back to the first slide, it, they range anywhere from $500 to $25,000, but some of these LiDAR cameras and some of these drones are excess of $75,000. So protecting your, your drone on a physical damage side for whether it's your established business or your individual drone operator that's just started up, protecting that equipment is extremely important. Your war risks, your malicious acts or damage, your TRIA, uh, war uh, in, the drone, in the drone market is, has been very minimal uh, as far as exposure goes. I think the the most recent or last one that happened, last claim that happened a few years ago was a a person was operating a drone, operating a DJI on a beach and landed the aircraft. The aircraft was away from their reach and a homeless person stomped on it. So as far as war risk goes or hijacking malicious damage, there's very little exposure out there, but it still is covered within the aviation specific policy. Personal and advertising injury, injury really speaks to invasion of privacy. And then it has also has some of your GL coverages, premises, medical, fire legal, non-owned liability would be you either hiring an operator or work on your behalf or you using someone else's drone. That's included at no additional premium, although we do ask if there is any exposure. There's a worldwide territory the open, there's open pilot language, meaning as approved by the named insured and appropriate license for the flight being conducted. 
and then a, it's any use on the operations of the named insured. This is your standard application, although most of this is now going online, whether it's through your broker, uh, your your local aviation broker, or through Willis, the people who help set up this webinar. I'll just briefly highlight some of the questions and operations that we really want to key in as underwriters and clients or brokers. Will the UAS be operated in accordance with applicable regulations at all times? We would like that to be selected, yes. If it's selected, no. We would like them to elaborate on or have the, the broker elaborate on the exposure just so we get a better understanding. But 99% of the time, that should be selected, yes. Is the UAS operated indoors in proximity to pe any persons not directly participating in its operations? So the FAA airspace applies to actual airspace outside of buildings, not, not including indoors. So once you are flying indoors, it does exclude all part 107 rules and regulations, which is interesting and that's why we ask if you're flying over people. Will the UAS be intentionally operated over any persons, not directly? Something along the same lines where we would like to find out if there's any exposure because the, there's a high concentration of exposure when you're flying over people. Do you intend to publish by any means data or images obtained or created by the operation of any UAS operated by you or on your behalf? This is where you get your invasion of privacy coverage. And with regards to how you publish any of the data, if you're going out and filming your neighbor's backyard and then publishing it to, to YouTube without their consent. Do you have any procedures to control the publication of data or images? Again, back to the invasion of privacy. And then you can see all the uses that are available on that application. Any questions with regard to the, the operations or application? Doesn't look like any. All right. No. Probably one of the most important parts or everyone would, would like to know, how much does your average drone policy cost? It starts with your liability limits. Your average liability limit is 1 million, but up to 500 million. Your premiums can start anywhere from you know, $450 for a single unit at, at 1 million liability, and that is $450 per unit. So as your fleet gets bigger, there are discounts, understanding that you can't always fly one drone, uh, more than one drone if there's only one operator. The hull or physical damage is applies a hull rate to the value. Typically comes with deductibles of five to 10%. There are blanket policies available for large fleets and they do need to be contract certain. So you couldn't request a blanket policy without us knowing the actual schedule of drones, uh, which is uh, hopefully pretty understandable. But there's several examples of blanket policies for ones that are changing, uh, like Intel, uh, for example. They, Intel has the done the Olympics, the light shows, or uh, operated at the Super Bowl. So something like that where we can't keep keep tra or the broker and us could not keep track of the amount of times they're swapping units in and out. So for those for that case, they have a blanket liability policy, but it doesn't have to be a Fortune 100 company. It could be anyone for up to five units. It doesn't have to be Intel. The values are increasing. Payloads often get bigger with uh, dollar value. Uh, payloads cannot be you know, in excess of $100,000 for some of these units. Changes are frequent uh, and it's, it's more like personal lines than general aviation. And the reason we mention that is because with the more expensive as, an, the more expensive an aircraft gets, the more qualified typically and trained in safety procedures that a client has. But we don't see that directly correlating in the drone industry, meaning the person who buys your DJI Inspire One will 
doesn't have a higher likelihood to crash than someone operating with a fifty thousand dollar camera which is something that we've we've found out uh, the hard way there's port portal technology it's becoming more common and uh, online based on the number of submissions we're seeing in excess of 10 to 10 to 50 submissions a day Back to liability coverage, I explained that, uh, and I don't think we have we have time to jump into policy wording, so I'll stop here and highlight any coverages. The physical damage, uh, excuse me, it's jumping around here. Invasion of privacy. The Personal injury, personal adverti in advertising industry, it really pertains to the the subsection E on the bottom there. The oral or written publication in any ma manner of material that violates a person's right of privacy. So the biggest invasion of privacy lawsuit that's come about through the drone and in insurance industry has been out in, in Australia, actually. It was someone that was sunbathing in their backyard and the drone operator next door accidentally caught footage of the, of the grandma next door sunbathing and then that was published to a billboard. So that's been the biggest $5 million lawsuit or up to $5 million lawsuit that I believe is still pending that we are not on the book. So I, I am able to, to comment on. The payload. Payload coverage uh, is respect to the gimbal. The gimbal, the camera, and the reason why I want to bring this up is the, the payload can change. So if a payload is interchangeable, I'm sorry, well, I have a little bit of difficulties, guys. The, if the payload is interchangeable, see that at the bottom there, there's a Sony, Sony camera. If you are covering the physical damage of your payload on the UAS policy, and then your operator takes off the camera, brings it to their, brings it to their friend's wedding without the drone, then they would not find coverage for the payload because it's not being transported or used on the scheduled aircraft. Something like finding your or covering your camera or valuable items could be found maybe on the uh, inland marine or your homeowners uh, type policy. But with regards to payload, our our intent is to cover the camera or payload with relation to the actual scheduled aircraft. Ground equipment, uh, it's very similar. The, your ground equipment is operated by a controller uh, and that's typically covered. And then your iPad or iPhone is also covered. I'll jump right into additional, additional insureds. Additional insured certificate requests are, are done at no additional premium. Certificate, this is your common example of a certificate. Uh, the customers that are used to seeing commercial general liability policy type wording or cord type wor wording is why at the bottom red arrow, we included this wording as of la a couple months ago, actually. Policy includes commercial general aviation liability coverages with limits as shown in the policy. So we got a lot of requests for general liability that could be defined under you know, several ways, but it's really the third party bodily injury property damage that you could cause arising out of the scheduled aircraft and not necessarily needing commercial general liability for your drone policy. Products and completed operations is another 
part of the drone insurance industry that I don't think we need to touch on too much, but it's the same, it's very similar to any type of products and completed operations coverage. So if a drone were to go down, uh, a DJI drone were to go to down and hurt someone, you could bring in both the named insured of the person operating the aircraft, and if for some reason there's a defect on the actual aircraft itself, the manufacturer could be dragged into the lawsuit as well. And there is products coverage under a separate policy. Non-owned liability, it gets a little blurry between who is responsible or what the intent behind the coverage is. It's included on every single policy at no additional premium. However, if there is the exposure of our named insured hiring dr a drone contractor, we would like to know. InsureTech, this is the Verify that I mentioned earlier. There's also several, several other options, DroneInsurance.com and Skywatch. There's certainly no, there's no shortage of InsureTech investment right now. And those are just some of the insurance options for really geared toward more of your hobby user who only flies a few times a year. Now, lastly, on the claims in risk management best practices, the insurance market for drones. <laughs> in our experience, the majority of claims are rooted in, in trees. So hitting a tree, whether it's sense and avoid, the sense and avoid technology, not interpreting the tree as a solid object and flying directly into trees. So the insurance market for drones primarily has been on the physical, physical damage side as percentage of claims although not necessarily as payouts. As I mentioned, there's some significant high liability claims out there. Claims causes. Um, the majority of operator error, it could be anywhere from battery issue to firmware upgrade, uh, installing them onto your computer, getting the updates the same way you update uh, your iPhone. Mainly uh, first party physical damage, but lots of near misses, like the one in the Olympics right there to the right. Is a catastrophe waiting to happen? Uh, I think uh, we all could agree the cat catastrophe out there is out there as far as an exposure. The Sikorsky Blackhawk was the first United States run in with an aircraft. Luckily, it's a Sikors Sikorsky Blackhawk and a four pound drone did not you know, bring it down. The there's been plenty of near misses, in, including the one on the bottom left and the Emirates 380 on the right. Again, there's been hundred, hundreds of claims paid, mainly physical damage. Expensive does not mean good or better operator uh, flying them. And I'll keep going. Risk management. So that really, risk management really pertains to the first getting your license, but also ongoing training, which is why you'll see training in two of the two of the four boxes on your right, and awareness and continued education. Continue training, meaning understanding the regulations as the FAA comes out with updates, whether that's beyond visual line of sight operations or anything else, there's plenty of ongoing factors to get a better understanding of the airspace, but also understanding of your aircraft itself, whether it's pre-flight inspections, standard operating procedures, or working with one of our safety partners, uh, dartdrones.com. Dartdrones.com is a national safety provider for both online both online and in-person courses. So whether it's prepping for your part 107 or prepping for your uh, getting a, a better understanding of rooftop inspections or oil and, oil and gas and finding those clients, dartdrones.com is our safety provider uh, any global client can utilize them up to 20% or more um, at a discount. And SM4 is our safety program that consists of safe, 
big household names or safety experts. It, it's really rooted on four parts, safety management, planning, prevention, response, and recovery. Thank you guys for listening. I'll open it up to questions. If you do have any questions or need to reach out to me, please write down uh, my contact information. I'm happy to help anyone. So thank you so much, Patrick. A very thorough presentation. I've had a couple people text me that uh, they really enjoyed it. Um, can you send me your presentation so I could send it to those people that have attended? Yeah, I absolutely can. And I'll send out the recording also uh, to that, to the uh, presentation and also to others within our, uh, within our group. Um, what uh, typically when you're talking to people about drones, what's the biggest question you typically get? The most common question, so any aviation insurance policy you have to go through to place an aviation insurance policy, you have to go through a broker. So luckily, we are not the, the first point of contact for every person who buys a drone on Amazon. So we, our, questions, our questions are evolving and getting better, but it's really, um, if I have a midterm change, so a policy is incepted, how, does that, how is that handled? And it's handled two ways. It's by newly acquired aircraft. So if Joe Smith has a real estate inspection company and he has a Inspire, DJI Inspire 1 and he purchases an Inspire 2, does he have coverage before he tells you that he needs coverage on the, on the aircraft? And that he has up to 30 days reported. So that, that newly acquired provision is something that has automatic coverage, but also can help you know, put them at ease that we automatically will accept a claim up to 30 days for any newly acquired aircraft within the scope. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, you talked about uh, physical damage being your uh, fre high frequency. From a, from a severity perspective, on the liability side, what's the, what's some of the uh, biggest trends from a severity on the liability side? I think it's a little early to tell as far as trends, but I can tell you some of your most common ones will be hitting a car or building, your drone hitting a car and, you know, having a standard property damage claim. And but also it, it could be as much as, you know, crashing in a, in a field and having the entire field burn down or having your drone in a casino hitting someone in the face and lacerating their eye. So there are several very high liability claims out there and that doesn't even consider the drone industry being extremely extremely safe and lucky for not hitting or bringing down an aircraft so the uh so it's typically the property damage or the general liability against the drone or the drone operator is there are there any privacy issues has that ever come up is that a big issue we haven't seen privacy issues because the FAA doesn't technically, def uh, they, they don't help define it. But although there are several state and local municipalities that have defined invasion of privacy or under the personal and advertising industry, Colorado, for example, is one of the states that has, has gotten more strict laws regarding the invasion of privacy. But as far as claims goes, we've been relatively claim free on on invasion of privacy or personal and advertising injury and the, the one expert you said from a safety perspective what's the what are the fees associated with that training do you know oh yeah i took it myself so uh their their classes range anywhere from your online course that self pace to study for your part 107 and that could be anywhere from you know, 100 to 250 dollars, or it could be a having ha, you have a risk manager who has a drone operator 
that wants to you know get better safety procedures or understand aerial inspections a little bit better to receive continued training they could go out to an in-person course and that could be anywhere from 250 to to 500 dollars so the company is evolving they started on dart on uh actually on shark tank and a couple years ago and they've evolved from uh, just a web-based course to in person at almost every major city around the country now okay excellent yeah well thank you so much patrick uh, we're all over our allotted time you guys have i appreciate all the people that participated uh, we'll be sending the recording out and the presentation and uh you know if you have questions you can definitely reach out to patrick or myself and we'll see what we can do about answering your questions thank you for much so much sir thank you dan and thank you guys have a great rest of the day